we don't give people looking to build applications enough tooling, essentially, to build what they're trying to do. They have to go build their own tooling to actually build the app that they want to build. And that is a huge roadblock. And it's also probably the reason why a lot of people build in other ecosystems. They have the tools they need in these other ecosystems just handed to them, and they can focus on their app. We need to get to that point with EOSIO. So that way, you know, somebody wants to build an NFT gallery or marketplace or something where they can just take this tool set and build their vision without actually having to build the core components of EOSIO themselves. That's the general premise of this entire proposal. To start with and put a little bit of context on it, when we're talking about the core development, there are three major components. The first one, which we started all of this based upon is the core software itself. It's the platform. It's Nodios and it's the thing that we all run for block producers and APIs. The other two components are the APIs themselves, which we covered a decent amount in the API Plus paper. And in the wallet paper, the other one is software development kits. So just to put that in perspective of why this is being brought forth, this is the first proposal that'll probably be a long series of proposals in building a new series of software development kits for client-side technologies for EOSIO blockchains. This first step will be to both build the core protocols that every client SDK can utilize and to actually build the first full SDK, which would be focused on web technologies. In the paper itself, it outlines it a little bit throughout the paper that everything that we learn while doing the web client SDKs, we can then apply to things like mobile apps or games or whatever other type of platform you can imagine somebody building an EOSIO application on. You know, that maybe there's like metaverse client SDKs and whatever new thing comes out in the next couple of years as a platform to target for these technologies. So this proposal itself focuses on that web segment of potential apps that are built in the ecosystem. The recommendation itself is what we're getting to here. It is to actually build a full product suite for the web environment for these SDKs. It'll have its own identity, which could be bound to the new identity that the branding and efforts are going through, or it could be completely standalone. Examples from other ecosystems, like you do have some that are branded specifically as Ethereum or whatever, or you have things like hard hat or Morales or these like more ambiguous words that are focused on specific ecosystems. But this product suite for the web would have its own identity, the whole suite would, and then it would have more generic specifications and standards that will come along with it that'll be applied to other non-web SDKs. The suite itself is a stack. This tree kind of goes bottom up, like the bottom is the foundation and the top is kind of the entry point for new developers. So starting at the top, the first thing new developers are going to have is this starter kit. It is a templated thing that consists of everything below it and could be modified to fit a specific chain's need, like Theo or Wax or Telos or any of these chains. If they have something specific and unique about their chain, they could embed it in the starter kit. The starter kit itself is going to be made up of all the other components and it's a recommended, here's where you get started. The client library is what we would today consider to be like a UAL or something along those lines. This is the integration point for an application developer that knows what they're doing and they don't need a starter kit. They'll be using the client library and the client library has plugins and all of the client library stuff is based on the core library, which serves as the foundation for any web library that's built upon this. And the core library also has extensions. Both the plugins and the extensions can be chain specific or can be chain agnostic. It offers that flexibility that I think we can need in EOSIO. The paper makes a case for that. I don't necessarily have to pitch it to you guys. This project itself is to get started as soon as possible. It's treating this as core development and creating the foundation for people to build these web applications on any of these chains. As someone that's been working myself with developers across all chains, when people have issues integrating Anchor, they come to us. And whether that's an issue with EOSJS or UAL or the Swift or Java SDKs, how that plays into their apps and all these other things. This is where my team has seen so many struggles in the ecosystem. It is that we don't 
don't give people looking to build applications enough tooling, essentially, to build what they're trying to do. They have to go build their own tooling to actually build the app that they want to build. And that is a huge roadblock. And it's also probably the reason why a lot of people build in other ecosystems. They have the tools they need in these other ecosystems just handed to them, and they can focus on their app. We need to get to that point with EOSIO. So that way, you know, somebody wants to build an NFT gallery or marketplace or something where they can just take this tool set and build their vision without actually having to build the core components of EOSIO themselves. That's the general premise of this entire proposal. And we go into a lot of detail about the various components and we give some examples. Like when we're talking about identity, we give Morales, the graph and hard hat. Like those are solid brands that developers know of and places where they can go and get started with these technologies. We also want to include things like training in this and documentation and onboarding of developers and really just improving the developer experience so they can focus on what they need to do. The effects we believe, just to run through those really quick, is that it's going to improve the user experience as well as standardize it across EOSIO chains, making it easier for people to make the jump. The new developer experience is going to be vastly improved. People like me don't have to answer people's questions with, you can't do that right now. If you want to do that, you have to build it yourself. That's always a big turnoff to developers from what I've seen. The existing web developers in the space seen through our own experiences are also going to have an improved experience. We've been onboarding people into what we've been calling EOSIO Core, which is a JavaScript replacement for EOSJS that falls under the umbrella of this thing. And everyone we've talked to so far that's actually switched has really appreciated the move and the shift in how this framework allows them to build their applications. It gives them access to all the deep fundamental tools they need to do the things that they want to do. It's a lot less handholdy and developers can experiment. On our side and on other wallet developers' side, it's going to improve that experience as well. This is a point for wallets to hook in and abstract their technologies away so that way applications can just integrate them. The core developer experience on that list is to build a client library on top of the core library, but the core developers would also be able to build other client libraries to do other specific things. So these core developers that are looking to build technologies for maybe specific use cases that we haven't imagined will be much improved because the core library at the foundation of all of this is robust enough to handle that. We don't have that today, period. We do in the stuff that my team has released, but overall, like most developers are unaware of that. And the final kind of improvement that we anticipate this offering is that it's going to reduce the dependency on API operators. We're going to be able to optimize call patterns. We're going to be able to make recommendations for new calls that could drastically improve the efficiency of APIs. And we're going to be able to help mold what APIs look like going forward. This proposal is not to build those APIs. On the journey of building this first client library, we're going to discover like where all the pain points are. I probably, not I, but my team has probably seen half of them, as have many of you, in the inefficiencies of having to use these APIs. But we're going to find more. And that's kind of the point of that benefit is we think that we're going to learn a lot about APIs and how we can move forward in actually improving them. Right now, we have estimated the cost at just a little over a million dollars for development, for branding, for project management, for generating out that documentation, for building boilerplate code that people can be able to use and just run with, and really building a package that client developers are going to be excited to use. I know I would be excited to use it as a client developer. We think that we can get it done in under a year. Obviously, that we could scale up the costs and bring more people in and that time frame could be reduced. Honestly, finding developers that are capable of this level of work is hard. And the ones that are capable of it are off doing other things. So we crunched numbers on our side. We do have a spreadsheet that kind of backs these numbers and breaks down a little bit more. But these are the estimates we came up with. Also came up with a breakdown of what is actually required, what we're recommending, which is that middle column. And then if you want absolutely everything, which in this chart, the everything just adds developer training. It's let's do videos. Let's maybe sponsor some hackathons. Let's do coursework and blogs and everything you can imagine to just get new developers 
suited to this code. That can always come after the fact as well. So that's why we didn't actually include it in the recommended. So in general, that's proposal four of the Wallet Plus paper. It is honestly the one that I am most excited about. And I think I probably spent the most time in. There are some other good proposals in there if this one is not suitable. But I do think that this proposal, based on my experience working on all of the chains, I think it would benefit each and every one of them. It plays off the core fundamentals that all these chains share. Like as an example there, accounts. We all have accounts on all of these chains and there's some abstraction in the SDKs that could really benefit developers if we leveraged it. So right there, there's one example of some core fundamental piece that would benefit them all. But the flexibility of the system, chains like FIO, with all of their chain-specific API calls that are very bespoke to that network, the flexibility of this SDK will allow them or us or whoever's building this to build that stuff into the client, to the developer experience. That way, as people are building applications on that chain, they'll have access to chain-specific logic, essentially. So I think this is probably one of the strongest proposals that fits across all chains. I think we can release this stuff piecemeal and it could all be developed in the open and very engaged in the whole process. If we were the team that were taking this on, which we're very excited to be able to offer to be able to do that, we would start, for example, with getting EOSIO core in a place, that library as to where it is documented, and we can start getting like more low-level programmers using it in a matter of like weeks. There are people on this call I know that are already using it. It's just there's no documentation and you need to dig into it. Like the deliveries, it's not going to be that after nine months, here's the whole thing. It's going to be there will be little drops along the way. And potentially we would look for applications that want to grow with this framework and get started with it as soon as possible. Within maybe one or two months, we would want them to be the beta testers of this application. Our team took that approach with Anchor. Like we had some early adopters of Anchor and we really worked closely with them to make sure that the flows back and forth were suitable. And I imagine we could do something similar with this. We can definitely do incremental releases along the way and work with the community. Um, in terms of other proposals in the paper, I'm sure there are. I don't have one specifically in mind that I could just pull out of my hat right now, but there may be. I, I want to say maybe the application registry, which is one of the other proposals, but mm. I don't know that benefits all chains because not all chains run applications like UX and FIO, you can't deploy smart contracts onto. So there's not really a need for the registry there, but that might be a huge need for the public networks where anybody can deploy their own contracts. And to go back all the way to the start when I did talked about this, this is for the web version of these SDKs. And that is really just the first step. As we begin making progress and like we're defining standards and protocols along the way, once we hit a certain point, we might be able to fire up, okay, let's start the app development SDKs in parallel now that we have the standards. And then we have a team that's working on like, here is the implementation in Swift. So iOS applications can be built easier. And here's a Kotlin SDK for Android applications. And maybe we have one for Unity and one for Unreal and all these other platforms that we know people want to build applications on, this can start as the initial step in this long process of building out potentially dozens of SDKs over the course of the next, I don't know, five years or something. So that kind of also goes back to one of the reasons as to why this is a logical starting point, because as soon as we figure out one of them, that unlocks the ability for us to start proposing other ones by other teams that are stronger in those areas.